Hi there, guys. Morning. Hello there. Hi there. Whoa. Hey, it was yeah, raining. Have... It, it looks like you have fire behind you now. Is it going to dry up all that rain? <laughs> I've act, I've got so many comebacks for that, but I'd rather not say. <laughs> you feel if, like if you're if you, in hell right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me just go. confirm that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, folks, yeah, the 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 Wi-Fi just went off for five minutes to ten minutes, and we we're going to have a rolling blackout, which means I'm not going to have power for two hours. So I'm asking if I could possibly Keith steal your your hour now. Otherwise, okay, you I'm, need to do yours now. If I could, I would okay. really appreciate it, folks. Certainly. Um, Let me, um, I think you're already on there. Um, yeah, because it's um, it's okay, been. Let a, me go. Let me go change the the, uh, the title. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Keith. <clears throat> All right. Um, Sandy, if you don't mind, I'm going to start because I don't know when this thing is going to go off. Right ahead. And uh, my canoe is parked outside for a quick getaway. Um, with all the rain we're having so yeah so folks uh, good morning to you all uh, i got a part of uh, um, ted's message this morning and then christian's message last night was or yesterday was just unbelievable um, and uh, the, the the little sermon that i'm doing this evening uh, has a couple of slides that that overlap with his but um, what i want to do this evening is maybe just to mere look Near, uh, nearer look to the people that were involved um, in the martyrdom um, of uh, Polycrates and so on. So um, that's more where, where I'm going to come from this morning because I think a lot of time we just look at the, the, the black and white history. We don't look at, at the person and uh, how that relates to us today. So let us close us, our eyes for prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, I praise you today for this wonderful, wonderful feast that you've given us this week. Lord, you know that we are here to bring your word to your people. And Lord, we ask it for a big blessing this evening. And Lord, let this be your words and not mine. I ask that you, you mightly bless everybody who's watching. And Lord, that we be joyous in your presence. We ask this in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. So um, I was reading a book by a guy called um, David Burkott. I don't know if you've ever read his books, okay? Um, it's also sort of off on which my, my sermon for tomorrow night is, is, is also uh, based on. Um, and uh, he's a, call it a, 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 a religious historian, not a church historian, more religious. And uh, he writes some very good books um, telling about the Waldenses, the Anabaptists, uh, and all of these type of things. But he also, uh, his, his book also deals with, with those very early Christians and the, uh, the martyrs, uh, the, the, the disciples that were martyred, uh, and so forth. And so I thought, you know, one of the stories that I really wanted to, to look at uh, was specifically the one um, of the very first person who was actually then, uh, according to history, executed for, for keeping the Passover. So Matthew 16, 18 says, And I say also unto you that you are Peter, but upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of, of the grave shall not pray, prevail against it. So there are three major points noted here in Jesus' words. First of all, Christ will have a church in this world. Second of all, his church will be mightily attacked. And third of all, none of Satan's attacks will destroy it. That wonderful word, Ecclesia. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, I remember so, so vividly many years ago hearing uh, uh, Walter Feit 
and Stephen Bohr at the same camp meeting doing a, a explanation of the word Ecclesia. Um, and then uh, Ranko Stavanovich, when he was doing sermons from his book uh, on the revelation, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay, um, also talking about Ecclesia. So in Matthew 16, 18, the word Jesus, the word Jesus used for church is Ecclesia. And that's the word Strong's uh, 1577. And it's also translated in the King James Version 115 times. So the Greek word uh, means an assembly or a group of people called together for a purpose. It contains no implication at all of sacredness and holiness. This is very interesting, and I had to go read up on this because I didn't want to say the wrong thing here with, with all the, the learned people uh, around the table here because I can immediately see people going, okay, so what is he saying there? But it really doesn't imply that according to Strong's. And I looked at Strong's and some of the other concordances I have. So in practical usage, it's commonly identified people called by a magistrate for a public service of some sort. This is how it's used in Acts 19, 32 and 39, and then in Acts 41. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. So the word there specifically talks to just a general group of people. So in modern uh, uh, English Reader's uh, Digest Great Encyclopedia Dictionary reflects this in its definitions for the church. Well, they say that a church is a building for Christian worship, a regular for regular religious services, a local congregation of Christians. So we regularly use all three in our everyday speech in writing, allowing the context to indicate which is intended. And, but now, however, this is very important. In the Bible, the word church never refers to a building, to worship services held within that building. It always refers to an assembly, a group, or a congregation of what? Called out ones who belong to the Lord, who worship Him and fellowship with others of the same mind. And folks, that's us. That is our congregation this evening. So you will be happy to hear that the Lord has approved our church. No church board. Merely members who fellowship together with the same mind, same goal. And what do we do? We praise the Lord on His holy days. So we can say hallelujah. We are defined as a church. So Jesus' words were also fulfilled in Matthew 16, 18, in that there was a true church of Christ in the world without question. So that church at, at various uh, time frames in the, in the, since, since the, 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 uh, the ascension of, of, of Christ to his Father, since then there has been the church of Christ in this world in, in various forms. Every level of secular and religious leaders and their subjects have publicly and forcefully, with every cunning and deceitful means at their disposal, denounced and persecuted the true church. So now we know, if we look at that uh, thing, and that comes from this book, by the way, and it's very interesting that, that when I read that, it so, it so made me feel comfortable and warm and and, and, and happy because that means that I am in the real church because how many times have we not been persecuted out here and I truthfully believe and I've said this before that and, and in fact it's been said of us as a, as a community that we are probably the happiest and the most content people in terms of our religion and those are the so-called feast keepers we, we know of many other groups, and we won't mention them online because they might take offense. But we know some of the other doctrines where people are fighting each other like there's no tomorrow and the splits that happen, okay? But it's rare that I've actually seen people who, whose, whose focus is around the liturgy, the worship during the feast times. 
that they actually fight each other. Yes, we can have disagreements. And uh, I know Keith really sent me stuff here and he says, Ayn, you know, I checked you out there. No, Keith, I'm only joking. <laughs> But it's good if we if we can chat to each other in a safe environment because this is what Bible exploration church is all about. It's a safe environment where like-minded people can truly talk to each other. And our, and and Jesus' words are fulfilled within us. That church has endured and held its testimony of Christ throughout every attack abroad against it. We are still here, Sandy, despite everything that's happened at Terra Bella. You might have not been able to hold on to, to the, the property, but the ministry of the Lord is still yours. He is still encouraging you and saying, Sandy, Bible exploration is yours. Okay? You are the leader of this, this church. And that's how I see you, by the way. Please, let's not go down the ordained route and things like that. I truly see Sandy as the leader. She's the one who holds us together. And we can only praise the Lord for that. Okay. And once again, she's gone through many attacks, both from the church and from other aspects as well of her life. And I'm tonight, I really want to say to you, Sandy, thank you so much once again. I think it was mentioned yesterday as well for everything that you do for us as a church community. It will be long remembered, and there's a crown in heaven for you. Well, I do have. So help. it's passion. Huh? <laughs> I do need it's help. Passion. <laughs> Give me eight months, and I'll come help. It's passage through the storms caused by violent anger and hate has been there to show the experiences of those who honor the honor of God, stood firm, and will be an example for those who follow. You know, a lot of times I get very sad. And then I get angry, then I get sad, and sort of my emotions go up and down when people speak so ill of this group of people. Because I know you. I know the love that is in your hearts. I know the sincerity that comes from this group. And when people talk ill about you, it's that storm, that, that thing against Satan. But now what I've done with this is I've actually printed this out and put it against the wall here right by my desk. Matthew 16:18. The Lord recognizes our church. I know that now. So let's talk about Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians and his martyrdom. There's a little booklet on it and I took a lot of the, the things out of there. But Polycarp was really a phenomenal man. Josephus writes about him. Uh, he writes about the good works he did. And so on. He was respected on, on, on every level. The, the Romans respected him. Um, the people respected him. Okay. Uh, even the Jews, to a greater extent, respected him. Okay. And he walked very closely with the Lord, as I'll show you in a moment. So he's martyrdom. Uh, sort of CA 69, what is it, Common Era or whatever, or whatever to, to 155, okay? So the early church was hated by society and the government of the Roman Empire for various reasons, such as the refusal of Christians to sacrifice to the gods. The empire went through many phases of demanding that Christians sacrifice, which meant denying their faith or be killed. The earliest attacks claimed the lives of many of the apostles. This text that follows is the story from around 160 AD of the martyrdom of Polycarp, the bishop of, bishop of the Church of Smyrna, a city in Asia Minor, um, modern Izmir in Turkey, devoted to Roman worship. The account is in the form of a letter from an eyewitness to other churches in the area. It is the earliest chronicle of martyrdom outside of the New Testament. Polycarp was at that stage a very old man. He was at least 86. My dad's 87. I can't believe that people actually got to those ages. But it also tells you that the Lord was with them. You know, the average age for, for that era we, we, when Jesus lived, when the disciples lived, was around about 37. That was the average age. People didn't live to long ages there. So 86 was a, was, well, he was doing well. Okay. And probably the last surviving person to have known an apostle 
having been a disciple of John. This was one reason he was greatly revered as a teacher and a church leader. One interesting feature of this letter is that the writer is very conscious of how Polycarp's death followed the pattern of Christ. And this is what I would like to share with you, you folks this evening. Because some of us might walk this path as well. So, in this introduction of this letter, the, the writer writes, We are writing to you, brothers, with an account of the martyrs, especially the blessed Polycarp, whose death brought, to the, perse brought the persecution to close. Almost all the events that led up to it reveal it to be another martyrdom in the divine pattern that we see in the gospel. For he waited for his betrayal, just like the Lord did, so that we might follow him in looking out for the needs of others as well as ourselves. True love desires not only one's own salvation, but the salvation of all our brothers. So I just want to do that. Okay. So all the martyrdoms which God allowed to happen, and remember that the devout will ascribe all things to his sovereignty, were blessed and noble. Who could not admire their honor, their patience, their love for the Lord? They were whipped to stretch, stretch sorry, um, till their veins and arteries were exposed, and still endured patiently, while even those who stood by cried for them. They had such courage that none of them let out a sigh or a groan, proving that they suffered from torments they were absent from their bodies, or rather that the Lord stood by them and talked with them. By the grace of Christ, they despised all cruelties of this world, redeeming themselves from eternal punishment. Sorry, folks. Let me just start that again. So all the martyrdoms which God allowed to happen. Okay. Remember that the devout will ascribe all these things to sovereignty. Were blessed and noble. Who would not admire their honor, their patience, their love for the Lord? <clears throat> they were whipped to shreds until their veins and arteries were exposed. And still endured patiently while even that those stood by cried for them. They had such courage that none of them let out a sigh or a groan, proving that they suffered from such torments they were, were absent from their bodies, or rather that the Lord then stood by them and talked with them. By the grace of Christ, they despised all cruelties of this world, redeeming themselves from eternal punishment by suffering of a single hour. The fire of their savage executioners appeared cool to them, because they fixed their eyes on the escape from the eternal unquenchable fire and the good things promised to those who endure. Things which the ear has not heard, the eye, nor the eye seen, nor the human heart imagined, but were revealed to them by the Lord. Sounds so much like Ellen White. And in fact, there's a piece in the testimonies where Ellen White writes something very, very similar. They were no longer men, but they already become angels. In that same way, those who were condemned to the wild beast endured dreadful torture. Some were stretched out on a bed of beds of spikes. Others were subjected to all kinds of torments, all in the devil's attempt to make them deny Christ. Here's this little gentleman. Oopsie, Daisy, come back. Let's go down there. All right. So the death of Germanicus. Now he was also there with Polycarp. In all the devil attempted, he failed, thanks to God. The heroic Germanicus encouraged the weak by his own endurance and fought bravely with the wild animals when the proconsul tried to persuade him to cooperate with, with for the sake of his own youth. He drew the wild beast towards himself and provoked it. 
in order to escape more quickly from this wicked world. Seeing all this, the amazed crowd of spectators cried out, Down with the atheists, i.e. those who do not believe in the Roman gods. Get Polycarp. So they were already crying for Polycarp's death. Okay, so, but one of the things that they wrote in this letter is they did not encourage voluntary martyrdom, which I, I actually was actually a teaching for me as well, because I've always thought, you know, when it comes to seven day Adventists and we have to face something like this, okay, how do you, how do you, do you, do you volunteer? How does it work? You know, I've, I've always had this picture of it, but this actually answered it. And it says, now one named Quintus, or Quintus, the Pyregan, who was lately come from Phyria, or Phrygia, <laughs> when he saw the wild beast, became afraid. This was the man who forced himself and some others to come forward voluntary for trial. Him, the proconsul, after many entreaties, persuaded to swear and offer sacrifice. Therefore, brethren, we do not commend those who give themselves up to suffering, seeing the Gospels do not teach to do so. So, it, it, it's, it's very clear here that the Bible says we do not give ourselves up for voluntary martyrdom. Okay, and I, I was searching for stuff, but I, I ran out of time because I wanted to see if I could find something in, in some, some of the Seven Day Adventist writings. I could only find something briefly, and, and this was also something that, that came out of the, um, the SDA uh, uh, commentary. And so it says here, by the way, when Quintus the Phyregan handed himself over for martyrdom with some others, the proconsul persuaded them to take an oath and sacrifice. This is why we do not approve of voluntary martyrdom, something the gospel does not teach us to do. So this came out of the SDA um, commentary. So Polycarp's vision also now still part of this letter that this person wrote. He said, when he heard about this, the redoubtable Polycarp was not in the least upset. Now this is about the death of Germanicus. And was happy to stay in the city, but eventually he was persuaded to leave. He went to friends in the nearby country, where, as usually spent the whole time, day and night in prayer for all the people and for the churches throughout the world. Three days before he was arrested, while he was praying, he had a vision of the pillow under his head in flames. He said prophetically to those who were with him, I will burn alive. Those who were looking for him were coming near, so he left for another house. And this is where the betrayal comes in. And please note, it's following the same path as that as Jesus in, in his path to the cross. They immediately followed him, and when they could not find him, they seized two young men from his own household and tortured them into confession. The sheriff called Herod was impatient to bring Polycarp to the stadium so that he might fulfill his special role to share the sufferings of Christ, while those who betrayed him would be punished like Judas. The arrest. The police and horsemen came with the young man at supper time on the Friday with their usual weapons as if coming out against a robber. That evening they found him lying down in the upper room of the cottage. He would have escaped, but he refused, saying, God will be done. God, sorry, God's will will be done. When he heard that they had come, he went down and spoke with them. They were amazed at his age and his steadfastness. And some of them said, Why did we go to so much trouble to capture a man like this? Immediately he called for food and drink for them and asked for an hour to pray uninterrupted. They agreed, and he stood and prayed, so full of the grace of God, that he could not stop for two hours. The men were astounded, and many of them regarded, or sorry, regretted coming to arrest such a godly and venerable old man. Entering the city. When he was finished praying, they put him on a donkey, and they took him into the city. So Polycarp refuses to deny Jesus. As Polycarp was being taken into the arena, a voice came to him from a heaven. Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. No one saw who had spoken, 
but our brothers who were there heard the voice. When the crowd heard that Polycarp had been captured, there was an uproar. The proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On hearing that he was, he tried to pers persuade him to apostate, saying, Have respect for your old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, Down with the atheists. Polycarp looked grimly at the wicked heathen multitude in the stadium, and gesturing towards them, he said, Down with the athe atheists. Swear, urged the proconsul. Reproach Christ, and I will set you free. Polycarp then said, Eighty-six years I have served him, Polycarp declared, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my saviour? I served. So eighty-six years I have served Christ, nor has he done me any harm. Now then, could I blaspheme the king that's who saved me? I bless thee for deigning me worthy of this day and this hour that I might be among thy martyrs and drink the, drink the cup of my Lord Jesus Christ. There were more attempts to make him submit. I have wild animals here, the proconsul said. I will throw, the, throw you to them if you do not repent. Call them, Polycarp replied. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. I will be glad, through to, though, to be changed from evil to righteousness. If you despise the animals, you, I will have you burned. You threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour and is then extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. It was all done in the time it takes to tell the story. The crowd collected wood and bundles of sticks from shops and public bars. The Jews, as usual, were keen to help. When the pile was ready, Polycarp took off his outer clothes under his belt and tried to take off his sandals, something he was not used to, as the faithful always raced to do it for him each wanting to be the one who touched his skin. This was how good his life was. But when they went to fix him with nails, he said, Leave me as I am, for he that gives me strength to endure the fire will enable me not to struggle without the help of your nails. He then prays. So they simply bound him with his hands behind like a distinguished ram chosen from the great flock for sacrifice. Ready to be an acceptable burnt offering to God, he looked up to heaven and he said, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of our beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the knowledge of you, the God of angels, powers in every, of every creature, and all righteous who live before you, I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among the, your martyrs, sharing the cup of Christ and the resurrection to eternal life both of soul and body, through the immortality of the Holy Spirit. May I be, may I be reached this day as an acceptable, or sorry, may I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice, as you, the true God, have predestined, revealed to me and now fulfilled. I praise you for all these things. I bless you and glorify you among, with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, to you, with him through the Holy Ghost, we both we glory both now and forever. Amen. A miracle occurred. When the fire was lit and the flame blazed furiously, we who were privileged to witness and saw the great miracle, and this is why we have been preserved to tell the story. The fire shaped itself into the form of an arch, like the sail of a ship when filled with the wind and formed a circle around the body of the martyr. Inside it, he looked not like flesh that was burned, but like bread that is baked, a gold and silver glowing in the furnace. And we smelled a sweet scent like frankincense or some such precious spice. Eventually, when those wicked men saw his body could not be consumed by fire, they commanded an executioner to pierce him with the dagger. 
when he did this, a dove flew out, and this may well light, have been a later interpretation or transcription error. So, uh, such great quantity of blood flow, flowed from the fire that the uh, sorry flowed that the fire was extinguished. The crowd were amazed at the difference between the unbelievers and the elect, of whom the great Polycarp was surely one, having in our own times been an apostolic and prophetic teacher, and the bishop of the Catholic Church in Smyrna. For every word he spoke either has been or shall be accomplished. Now I believe the Catholic part was put in here by the way. So the body. When the enemy saw the wonder of his martyrdom, his blameless life, and now he's crowning it with mortal immortality, he did his utmost to stop us keeping any memorial of him or taking possession of his body. Now folks, when I read this, I thought, you know, what, is, what does the Catholics do? Because this has got a lot of Catholic connotations in it when you read this. The Catholics like to take bones and venerate them, etc., etc. But it seems that Polycarp knew this. Okay, He inspired Nicetes, the father of Herod, along with the Jews, to ask the governor not to hand over his body for burial. They might turn from worshipping the crucified one. In other words, Jesus, he said, only to start worshipping this one. So he did not want him to be worshipped, and people might be led that way because of what happened. They did not realize that it was impossible for us to abandon Christ, who suffered for the salvation of the world, or to, uh, or to worship any other. The centurion, seeing the disturbance caused by the Jews, took the body and publicly burnt it. So there was nothing left. So nobody could venerate or then uh, um, actually... Uh, worship uh, Polycrates. Oh, sorry, Polycarp. So, this is the story of the blessed Polycarp, the 12th martyr in Smyrna. Though he has a unique place in the memory of all people, being remembered by, even by the heathen, he was not merely an illustrious teacher, but also a preeminent martyr whose death all desired to imitate, being altogether consistent with the gospel of Christ having overcome an unjust governor with patience and acquired the crown of immortality, he now with the apostles and the righteous glorifies God the Father with joy and blesses our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of our souls, the ruler of our bodies and the shepherd of the church throughout the world. So what did these martyrs believe? What was so terrible that they had to go through these martyrdom? And this is where, where the slides that... that uh, 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 Christian had up yesterday, a couple of them will overflow. Over, uh, so Passover versus Easter. In the first century, Paul wrote a letter to the Church of God at Ephesus, admonishing the brethren to stand therefore, having your loins girth about with truth. Paul spoke about the ravenous wolves that would creep into the church at some point. But now those stalwarts of faith had fallen asleep, and that very truth was about to be tested. As these pillars of the church died one by one, more faithful men followed, striving to adhere to the faithful, the faith once adhered to by the saints. One such adherent in the second century was Polycrates, who presided over the church of God at Ephesus. He came from a family of eight Christian bishops, all firm believers in the truth taught by the apostles. The apostle John passed down these teachings to another great student and Christian martyr Polycarp the bishop of the church in Smyrna. Polycrates knew Polycarp and the teachings of the apostle that the teachings the apostle John had taught him. So Christian spoke about the quarter decimal controversy last night. Just in short, in Rome, near the end of the second century, the church from all around came together to discuss the Paschal Feast. A few years earlier, Polycarp was a central figure in this ongoing controversy because like the Apostle John, all early followers of Jesus Christ, they worshipped on the seventh day Sabbath, Sat Saturday, and they kept the Passover on Nisan 14, not Easter. Polycarp defended keeping the Passover against the Roman bishop uh, Anicius, or Nicetus, whose desire was to see the Passover replaced by another festival known today as Easter. Polycarp remained faithful to Nice and 14 for Passover, 
adamant that the Apostle John taught him this truth about Passover observance, not Easter. This became known as the Quattro Deciman controversy. So, a question of no small importance arose at that time. All the Pharisees of Asia remained faithful to the biblical older tradition heralding the 14th day of the moon, the month, on which the Jews were commanded to sacrifice their lambs, should be observed as the feast of the Savior's Passover. And that comes from Eusebius, Church History, uh, chapter 23. So, it said, says basically, uh, we ought to obey God rather than man. To their credit, the bishops of Asia, led by Polycrates, stood their ground, and they were not about to compromise on this truth. Polycrates insisted, we ought to obey God rather than man. It was time to write a letter to Pope Victor. We observe the exact day, nice and 14 for Passover, neither adding nor taking away. This was the first line of the letter, a reminder to the Pope that Passover date cannot be changed by humans, Polycrates went on. For in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep, which shall rise again on the day of the Lord's coming, when he shall come with glory from heaven, and shall seek out the saints. The letter continued, Unlike some preachers today, these men of God knew these saints were not in heaven, but awaiting the resurrection saints. So Polycrates went on to name some of them, and Christian also referred to this last night, I won't read through all of them. Among these were Philip, one of the twelve apostles who fell asleep in Heropolis, his two aged virgin daughters, and another daughter who lived in the Holy Spirit and now rest in Ephesus. Moreover, John, who was both witness and teacher, who reclined upon the bosom of the Lord, being a priest, wore the uh, sacerdotal plate, he fell asleep at Ephesus, and then Polycarp and Smyrna. So a number of these people, these martyrs, had passed away already. So Christ is indeed our Passover, not our Easter. Polycrates bolstered his position about retaining the Passover date by naming these martyrs, knowing personally at least one of them, Polycarp, who was endeavoured to keep the unity of the Spirit. Then Polycrates gets specific about what they were observing. It is noteworthy these saints were not observing a festival of eggs and bunny rabbits celebrating the fertility or Easter, as some, of, of, as some, would, have, some would have you believe. They were insisting they would observe Passover, like their earlier brothers and sisters in Christ. They recognized that 1 Corinthians 5.7 was saying that Christ was indeed our Passover, not our Easter. All these observed the 14th day of the Passover according to the Gospel, deviating in no respect but following the rule of faith. So did you note the saints of God in the 2nd century observed the Passover according to the Gospel, not the Old Testament but according to the New Testament? The leaven. And I also, Polycrates, the least of you, do according to my tradition of my relatives, some whom I have closely followed. For seven of my relatives were bishops, and I am the eighth. And my relatives always observed the day when the people put away the leaven. I therefore, brethren, who have lived 65 years in the Lord, and have met the brethren throughout the world, have gone through the, every holy scripture, not frightened by terrifying words. For those greater than I have said, we ought to obey God rather than man. I could mention the bishops who were present, whom I summoned at your desire, whose names, should I write them, would constitute a great multitude. And they, beholding my littleness, gave their consent to the letter, knowing that I did not bear any gray hairs in vain, but had always governed my life by the Lord Jesus. So what happened? Despite their defenses, Bishop Victor excommunicated the Church of Polycrates and all the bishops who supported him. However, the bishop reversed his decision later on after several bishops, including Irenaeus, intervened. Little is known about what happened to Polycrates thereafter, but his letter to Bishop Victor is a testimony to those who stood up for the truth especially when they were in the minority. 
Today, the majority of Christians celebrate Easter and only a small minority observe Passover. We now have Easter as the ex accepted observation or observation as the resurrection, a festival with its root in paganism. Why do bunny rabbits, eggs and other fertility symbols have to do with the death, burial and resurrection of Christ? So the church abandoned the Passover and introduced Easter on a fixed date, the Sunday following the first moon after the vernal equinox. And Christian explained that last night. So the fundamental question. The fundamental question is which one of these observations is biblical? The one that describes the risen Christ as our Passover for which the Bible sets a date or the one the church observes as its own without any apostolic, biblical or divine authority. The festival which is wrapped up in meaning and dedicated to our Savior or the pagan rooted festival that introduces symbols that have nothing to do with Christ. Only you can choose. We are grateful to men like Polycarp and Polycrates and others who stood up for the biblical truth. So you're going to say to me this evening, so I'm, okay, we know that, but we know Seventh-day Adventists don't keep Easter. Do they? Do Seventh-day Adventists keep Easter? Well, there's a certain gentleman who believes that. He wrote a very, very nice article somewhere in 2000, and I think it was 16 or 17, uh, a little known gentleman called Ron de Priya. I don't know if you know him. But he wrote this article in the Signs of the Times, uh, also very little, not a very well-known um, uh, piece of literature in the Adventist Church. Sorry, I'm being very facetious. Please forgive me, Lord. So he writes, Bunnies and Buns, Where Does Easter Come From? by Ron de Priya. Easter eggs, attractive, tasty, mouth-watering, marshmallow-filled Easter eggs. And how can I forget the warm, delicious hot cross buns? Yes, that's just a small morsel of the sweet memories I have of Easter as I was growing up close to the awesome grandeur of Table Mountain, that being in South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa. He writes, where does Easter, this globally celebrated annual holiday, come from? While the early Christians were fully aware of the Hebrew calendar in which the Passover was still observed by practicing Jews, there were no direct available evidence that they participated in any celebration of the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which occurred on Passover weekend. It appears, though, as noted in mid-2nd century sermon attributed to Melalto, Bishop and Sardis, that some type of resurrection celebration was already established a century after the resurrection of Jesus. By the early 5th century, when Socrates wrote his Historia Ecclesia, Easter was reported to be universally observed, though at different times by the two major branches of Christianity. And despite the fact that neither Jesus nor his apostles had enjoyed, in, listen to this, had enjoyed keeping of this or any other such festival. So he thinks it's to be enjoyed. Theologian and church historian George Reed Anybody know George Reed in the Adventist Church? For us that have been, well, I would say some people that have been around for a while, you will know George Reed. George Reed notes, unquestionably, the resurrection was enormous important in the Apostolic Church, for it figures prominently in the evangelistic messages from the Apostles as recorded in the book of Acts. Yet, there is no suggestion that the resurrection made a new day holy. Okay, so what is he saying? Passover is a holy day? Is that what he's saying? Am I reading it right? Okay. Um, okay, so it was only found that uh, uh, um, in the Bible is to be found only one holy day of the week. Ah, oh, there he goes and spoils it. Okay, the Sabbath. Formed as part of the creation process of God himself and never suspended. While recognizing that Easter commemorates the resurrection of Jesus, Dr. Reed points out that the actual English word for East, Easter originates from the Anglo-Saxon Esther, the name of the pagan goddess of spring. Okay, It was actually the 8th century uh, that this name came to be applied in the commemoration of the Christ's, Christ's, sorry, Christ's resurrection. So how should a Christian relate to such pagan association 
and any non-biblical customs connected to Easter? Well, first of all, the question about the origin of a custom can be a major distraction. As what he says, so is Passover and Feast of Tabernacles, it's a major distraction. Since many modern practices have uh, ante antecedents in the ancient world, frequently for non-believers. For example, as noted in the Scientific American, the 62nd minute and 60 minute hour, etc., etc. I'm not going to go too much in that. He talks a lot of semantics there. So, second, as, as author and pastor Martin Weber admonishes, let's remember that Christ overcame the world and flesh and the devil. That victory happened on the cross, which exactly had been the ultimate cursed pagan symbol. Indeed, the Roman crucifix was one of the most disgraceful methods of execution. Dr. Weber continues, yet he turned that cross into the symbol of, sal of our salvation, so that we read in the Bible, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Weber then eloquently exclaims, Amazing grace that triumphs over e evil. God exercises his sovereign right of eminent domain, displacing the devil from pagan symbols and holidays and transforming them into the memorials of his salvation. I want you to think very carefully what this gentleman is saying, this Adventist. Okay? He says that things like Easter and all of those type of things, Jesus has changed into symbols for him. My only question is when did he do that? Because I don't read that in the Bible. That is a holy assumption. So, third as has been observed, third as many has ob been observed, many people show up at church only twice a year. Now this one just kills me because I saw that the other day as well. Okay? And this is now a reason to keep Easter because people only show up twice a year. Okay? Christians and uh, Christians uh, uh, and East, uh, Christmas and Easter. While committed Christians should never compromise the fundamentals of biblical faith, every chance must be capitalized on to share Christ. As the Apostle Paul stated, when I am with the Gentiles, I fit in with them as much as I can. In this way, I gain their confidence and bring them to Christ. But I do, discard the, uh, but I do not discard the law of God. I obey the law of, of Christ. Easter provides one of the best opportunities to thoughtfully share with the unchurched the wonderful truths about Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ministry in heaven. Now, please, I, I don't know if any of you have ever seen an Adventist book on this. I've tried to, uh, when I read this article originally, I thought, well, maybe I should just go and find out, is there anything on how you should relate to a Christian keeping Easter or Christmas? Um, do I go to their Christmas and have pork and wine with them? Or the Easter and, and, and have and play bunny rabbit outside? Okay, is, is, that, is that how I'm going to relate and tell them about Jesus? Okay, I'm, I'm just asking. Okay, just interested to know how would an Adventist do that? Okay, if anybody can maybe say. Okay, because truthfully I have family who believe this, this these holidays. Okay, and it is so far removed from trying to speak to anybody about Christ. I've yet to come across that. You might have the odd occasion. I will give you that. But for the majority of times, it's not about Christ. So already over the past several years, vibrant seven Adventist Christian congregations and educational institutions in Australia, Europe, North America have sought to, be, to creatively utilize Easter weekend to communicate the magnificent eternal verities of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection and over with overwhelmingly positive results. So my, my question to, to the gentleman is, so why can't you use Passover to do the same thing? Because we all know the Jewish Adventist ministries did it this weekend. It was in their advert that this was what they were doing. And they clearly said that they don't have Easter and they actually have a problem with Easter. But for the rest of the church, it's okay. We can go out there and have Easter, according to this article in the Science of the Times. So this affirmative approach to Easter is the fundamental accord with the basic manner in which one of the pioneers of Adventism recommended believers relate to Christmas. Now we all know who he's, re he's relating here to. She said, it can be made to serve a very good purpose. Even a Christmas tree may be made a great blessing. Shall we ha not have such a Christmas as heaven can approve? So in view of this pragmatic yet principle-based 
attitude. Let's ponder the possibility of deeper significance of the hot cross bun and the Easter egg with acknowledging the many different ways in which Easter is observed among Christians. According to Wikipedia, the hot cross bun is traditionally eaten on Good Friday, with the cross standing as a symbol for the, for the crucifixion. Easter eggs symbolize the empty tomb of Christ. Though an egg appears to be like a stone of a tomb and a bird hatches from it with life, similarly as the Easter egg, for Christians is a reminder that Jesus rose from the grave and that those who believe will also experience eternal life. So folks, buy an Easter egg. It's an example of the grave of Jesus. In brief, as Reed reminds us, Easter and its surrounding events can lend themselves to evangelistic outreach. Wherever there is an opportunity in advance, the message of Christ without compromising Bible truth, the wise as serpents, the harmless as doves counsel of Christ is appropriate. Let us joyfully glory in the cross and the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. So how was Passover replaced by Easter? We all know the story. When Emperor Constantine stopped the persecution of Christians in the 4th century, he declared that the Pascha would officially be celebrated on the Sunday after Passover. Several centuries later, the holiday was no longer called the Pascha, but Easter, and the date was modified to align with the solar calendar. Have we not gone the same way? Is history not being repeating itself? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, this evening we, we want to know that this is the truth that has been spoken. Lord, there are so many people that died for the word, for the truth. There are so many martyrs out there. Lord, and for the church, not the building, for the people, for the church, to say that Easter is okay, that Easter falls within the ambit of your holy days, Lord, is blasphemy. And we pray for these people, Lord, that say these things. We pray for them, Lord. Because we have been shown the truth of what it is that our pioneers had to endure. And our pioneers came from the time of Jesus. Through the Middle Ages and the Waldenses, the Albigenses. Martin Luther, all of the people and part of the Reformation, Lord, only to be sold out for an Easter egg and hard cross bun. Lord, we glorify you this week as we remember that you died for us and was risen on the third day, that you are in heaven for us today. We thank you for your sacrifice. We know the serious, but also the joy that we find in this, Lord. I want a special blessing this evening for each and every person here, Lord. A double blessing in the hearts and minds of every person listening here and being here. Lord, show us the way to better serve you, to be better part of your church. Because, Lord, you have verified and said to us, we are your church. We praise you for this and will forever. In the mighty name of your Son, Yeshua. Amen. Thank you. I hope that wasn't much. too bad. <laughs> While you were talking, I just got a message from somebody, which I've heard before, but he just said that he had heard that, I don't know, this year, I know it's happened before, that one of our churches had um, Easter egg hunt right in the sanctuary. Oh. Yeah, no, they have them. I've got, I've got pictures of them if you want to see them. Why in the world would somebody do that? I mean, no matter what you are, it's just, like I said, Halloween, they put the little candle in there and carve it and say, this is Jesus. I'm like, don't even, that that's... Yeah. Crazy. I must tell you guys one thing about Halloween when, when I was in Terra Bella 
So uh, obviously I've told you about my fantastic meal we had at Denny's, which I still believe is one of your best restaurants in America, is Denny's. Okay. So why are you laughing, Linda? Why are you people laughing? You know, we in no, South Africa are not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but Sandy took us to a, 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 a shop as well. I, I, it wasn't Costco. It was one of the others. Uh, Randy and them took us to Costco. But one of the other shops, there, and these, there was these big orange pumpkins outside. I'd never seen pumpkins like that. We don't grow pumpkins like that in South Africa. We've got a white pumpkin and a butternut. A butternut looks like somebody's upside down head, okay? But people buy those orange pumpkins there in your country just for Halloween, okay? And I never, uh, you know, you always see people in movies and whatever they do. The I'd never realized that there was such a big industry and that these pumpkins were so big. And it was like, you know, you don't even eat the pumpkin. You just do this thing to it. So it was. My son's that was, school, they have a day that they go out to a pumpkin patch to pick the pumpkins. All the kids do. Well, yes, I tell you. That's in I mean, I, Thank you very Sorry. much for the information on that. If you'd like a copy, I can send you a copy. <laughs> now she's frozen. Yeah. Sorry, we have um, a little issue out here. Somebody sent me a little video. I think the little cows that the guy has next door. Yes. <laughs> and some also into the gate and they're coming out. I, I, and I need to call the guy, but anyway, they're, <laughs> the cows are uh, getting out. It's the eight cows great. for all the wonderful people. Ali, you were <laughs> saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's encouraging just to know that in the future, when these things are happening to us, you know, the pain that we think we feel, yeah we yeah. may not even feel yeah you know and it's it's one of the things when i was writing that and going through it and reading because i've i've been reading a lot okay in between all the work i'm doing at the moment um to realize that you know the pain for us is very real um the persecution is very real you know i sometimes think adventists sort of wait for the persecution to happen you know we all have been persecuted that are sitting here in some sense or some way all right and it doesn't necessarily have to be bodily persecution. There's a mental persecution that's much worse. The mental anguish we get put through when you have to leave your, your church environment is is horrendous. Okay. Um, you know, to walk away from something that you believed you would never walk away from is is the anguish is is like it's it's worse than a divorce. It's worse than somebody dying. That's how I experienced it. And and the the rejection you feel the um, all of those things all of those things come up in your life. But you know what the Lord does that to really make us strong in the end times. And um, you know I, I I still have a lot to work on because of that. You will please excuse me for being a bit facetious and sometimes a bit sarcastic as well. Please just excuse me for that because I have to pray and ask the Lord for forgiveness and yourselves as well. But it shows the pain in my heart sometimes. It it shows. It, it just it doesn't sit well with me. I have an issue at work at the moment, which is very similar, where doing the right thing, telling the truth, is now seen as not the right thing. And I can't comprehend it. It does not compute with me because I've done the exact right thing. I've, I've said exactly the right stuff according to everything, but somebody has an agenda in a very senior position and it does not fit that agenda, and that agenda is dishonest. So it's hard, and that's how Satan works, guys. That's 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 the persecution that we will have to know. But the big thing is, we have a Bible expirations. We have each and every one of you have a ministry. You can you can still on on YouTube and on Zoom have communion, have fellowship like this. In fact, I think it's sometimes a bit better because you can fit in a lot of things next to each other. Um, it's it's a blessing. Okay. To me, it's a massive, massive blessing. And I thank you all for that. I'll pay you eight cows. <laughs> oh, and oh, speaking of community, I wanted to let you know, Sandy, that the chat is off. So we're not able to chat. Yeah, and the I chat's off. Yeah. We, we turn it off. Oh, 
I also wanted to say, um, if you didn't know, um, YouTube has a really marvelous reenactment of the life of Polycarp, the movie. And if uh, anybody, yes, I saw the movie, yeah. Oh, isn't it good? It, it's well, fantastic. It seemed, it seemed to be true to what you just read to us, even down to the yeah. detail about Germanicus, the young man, and all yeah. that. You know, I always wanted to, to, to read about it. I've just never had time. We always talk about Polycarp and the feast. That's all we talk about. But, you know, that whole thing, and the Christian actually put it so nicely in context, Easter, from a historical point of view. I really wanted to talk about the man. Who was that man that was the... You want to okay. raise your hand? Yeah. Uh-oh. What's that? Thunder. Somebody raised the hand. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I, Millie. Yeah, I did. I just wanted to know if you could send us the uh, your PowerPoint. Okay. You we have someone we'd email. like to. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll send uh, you an email. You okay, let me just. Okay, you got my email address. Yeah, I yeah, believe I so. You yeah, yeah, you have. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else want it? Please just drop me an email. And now I'm hoping that the, the lights don't go off in, a, in another three minutes. Um, they basically switching off all the power plants in South Africa in the next three minutes, probably. So we're going to go dark for two hours. Why are they doing that? <sighs> Paul, uh, let me put it to you this way. We, we had the best power supply company in the world pre-1994 before democracy. Okay after democracy okay we had something called bee uh equal employment for black people oh yeah yeah okay so all the yeah. white people were let go all the skilled people immediately and people got put in and over the last 30 years all our state owned enterprises <clears throat> like the post office doesn't exist anymore uh, our energy supplier that won international awards is gone it's basically the, the it's falling apart okay and with the floods and stuff we have now we have one um atomic energy plant which is about to explode okay it's down in the cape uh, so if you if you if you if you don't hear me or you just see a, a, a mushroom cloud you know it's from this side okay um yeah it's it's our railways they've stolen all the tracks on our, our railways doesn't exist anymore so our trains stop um yeah, it's just uh, these people have stolen trillions of rands, okay? And still they go out there and they say, "Yo, invest in South Africa, okay? And then people come, it's, it, 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 it's openly said, it's in the newspapers now, it's said that the government is a mafia conspiracy. It's, it's no longer, it's not even seen as a party anymore. They just steal, okay? Um, 